the threat of climate change um, you know, can often feel remote and presidential candidates get mocked when they actually say that it's a bigger threat than ISIS. But if you think about it logically, um, if there is no longer a planet, then the fact that people are at war or there's extremism happening, it doesn't happen anymore because nobody's here anymore. Climate change is not a wartime mission. You can't say, go attack climate change and take that hill. It doesn't work that way. However, if your job is to do humanitarian and disaster relief, you're going to see more of that. You're going to see Katrina. You're going to see Sandy. There were military members, thousands of military members, involved in both of those relief efforts. You need to know how it's going to affect those missions. And then also, it's going to affect security broadly. So if you look at a place like, like Alexander was saying, in the Himalayan region where most of the world's population lives, and there's less water, and there's less energy, and there's less food, you as a military organization need to understand how that's going to affect your interest and prepare for it. So the department is looking at all of those things. And then the last thing I'll say about that is they have an important role to play, but not every role to play. And it's complicated, right? Because it's the most trusted institution in this country. If you look at the annual Gallup polls about institutions that are trusted, the military consistently for many years comes out on top. Congress on the bottom, big surprise to anybody. <laughs> but I live in Washington, that's no yeah. surprise. Um, so this, it's important that they take action. Um, at the same time, you gotta understand what their role is and what it isn't. Um, so that's very important. The military has a role to play. They're moving ahead, they're not waiting to be told. On the other hand, in this country, they perceive it as a political issue. Um, so you won't see a lot of uniformed active duty military who will necessarily talk out unless it's their job to. And there are people whose job it is to be thinking about climate change in the military context. So it's a complicated picture um, and it's, so it's all of those things all at once. You know, when I, when I was a second lieutenant in the 1980s, I was a start off my career as an ICBM launch officer. I was one of the finger on the button people in nuclear weapons. And at that time, we had an adversary. And we knew where, I can't, I can't tell you where our missiles were aimed, but I can tell you that if we launched them now, we'd hit three McDonald's, a Walmart, and a Stuckey's. Um, and just a couple of years ago, a four-star admiral said, as the commander of all US forces in the Pacific, that the single greatest threat he faces is climate change. And in fact, Senator Imhoff summoned him before the Senate, assuming uh, that this four-star general, I think, would, would kowtow and which shows that the senator has spent very little time around four-star generals. Yeah. And uh, the, the admiral uh, basically said, no, this is the way it is, and, and insisted on it. And Imhoff literally changed the subject. Let me move on to another area, he said. Uh, so the US military uh, has been, uh, during my time and since, and the secretary has been involved in that exact kind of work, on the really cutting edge of this environmental stuff. If you come to my home in, Sh in Colorado Springs, and you go past Fort Carson, you go past the Air Force Academy, you will see hundreds and hundreds of military homes covered with solar cells. If you go to the Air Force Academy, you'll see 16 acres of solar cells. Uh, the military is not waiting for people to get it. But I think a real challenge becomes, uh, what do you want the military to do? And I say that both in terms of for you that are Americans, what do you want the US military to do? But also those from other countries, what do you want your military to do? In the 90s, um, we, had, you know, we had the Rio Summit in 92, which sort of launched us um, on a path to really pay attention to the environment on a global scale for the first time. And we had, at that po point, we probably had about a 30-year window, you know, to, to really bend the curve on climate change and reduce global emissions. And we have done actually zero in that time, where we, if you look at the, if you look at the IPCC report from 1992, had a few scenarios. We've been tracking above the worst-case scenario of that time. 